Man has long applied the latest science to the creation of weapons, but the industrial age has seen unprecedented leaps in man's capacity to manufacture ever more powerful machines, machines capable of inflicting death and destruction on a massive scale. From hand grenades to howitzers, flamethrowers to high explosives, and of course, the ultimate in devastation, the atom bomb. This is the story of modern man's insatiable desire to land the killer blow on the pathway toward mass destruction. Cannons first appeared on battlefields in the late 1300s. And during the Middle Ages, they became standardized, more common, and more effective, both in siege roles and against infantry. Effectiveness that led Shakespeare in his play Henry IV to have the character Falstaff describe his men before battle as food for powder. Cannon fodder was to become the popular term but not even Shakespeare could have imagined the power of the artillery designs of the 20th century. Technology that would create food for powder, the like of which had never been seen before. The French 75. The gun from which all modern field artillery is descended. The Canon de Soissons Cannes Model 1897 was the world's first truly modern artillery piece and instantly made every other field gun in the world obsolete. Every major offensive that the French army took part in in France on the Western Front during the First World War, the French 75 would be the key part in the preliminary artillery bombardment. Weighing only 1,500 kilograms in action, it fired a 75 millimeter shrapnel round weighing seven kilograms out to a range of 6,850 meters. But what was revolutionary about the French 75 was that its seven man crew could maintain a steady firing rate of up to 15 rounds per minute. This unprecedented ability to provide rapid, accurate fire was achieved by using a new and ingenious hydro pneumatic recoil system. The recoil mechanism in the French 75 meant that it would come automatically back to its originally fire position and did not have to be re-aimed before it was fired again. The entire cycle, including the return, took just two seconds. The gun also featured an all-new rapid-acting screw-type breech mechanism into which was loaded an innovative fixed round with the time-fused shrapnel-filled projectile and propellant charge pre-packaged in a brass case, which could be loaded in a single action. A combination of innovations in a single weapon that led to destruction on a scale that had never been seen before. It is estimated that the Allies alone fired over five million tons of shells during the Great War, and the Germans perhaps as much again. In all, over a billion projectiles plunged through the air in just four years. And when it wasn't raining lead, a deadly fog would drift in. On the evening of April 22, 1915, Allied troops looking across no man's land in southern Belgium saw a strange greenish-yellow cloud drifting toward them. The Germans had released 170 metric tons of chlorine gas along a six-kilometer stretch of the front. More than 1,100 troops would be killed and 7,000 injured in what was the world's first large-scale use of chemical weapons. The confined trench systems of World War I were ideal for achieving effective concentrations of gas. However, when it was released from cylinders on the prevailing wind, as it was that day, it was impossible to control. Firing gas at the enemy using artillery was the solution. 
chemical shells were first introduced by the Germans in 1916 using 150 millimeter artillery. Independent of the wind, delivery of chemicals became a much more accurate affair. But gas, like any weapon, evolves as a result of battlefield experiences. The main flaw associated with delivering gas via artillery was the difficulty of achieving a killing concentration. Each shell carried only a small payload and an area needed to be saturated to produce a cloud to be deadly. And both sides developed countermeasures, some primitive, others, like gas masks, becoming increasingly sophisticated. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. By subscribing to History Hit, you can access hundreds of hours of military history documentaries on demand. Follow in the footsteps of the Essex Dogs with Dan Jones or discover the history of archery with Ray Mears. We've built up an extensive library of history programs, hundreds of hours of documentaries, exclusive original films, interviews, and ad-free podcasts made for proper history fans. Sign up now for a free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. To nullify this, in 1917, the Germans introduced a chemical which did not need to form a concentrated cloud to be effective. Mustard gas. A volatile, oily liquid that was heavier than air. Having settled on the ground and in the soil, mustard gas remained active for weeks, even months, depending on the weather conditions. Poisoning was by contact. Troops would march through contaminated areas, unaware that they were being exposed. After returning to their trenches or barracks, they would then contaminate other soldiers. After contact, the skin of victims would blister. Troops would begin to vomit, suffer internal bleeding, and eventually blindness. Between 35 million and 66 million shells filled with chemicals were fired during World War I. Although the strategic power of gas was not in the number of soldiers it killed, less than 1% of fatalities and only 7% of casualties were attributed to chemicals. It was in the psychological terror they caused, fear that in World War II would be delivered by size. And on land, the largest Allied weapon of the Second World War was the American M1. Introduced in 1943, the Black Dragon, as it was called, was designed to penetrate thick concrete fortifications like those the Allies expected to encounter along the German Siegfried Line. And the key to its destructive power was its caliber. The larger the caliber, the faster the projectile, the higher the payload you can accelerate. You deliver a much more intense, a much more dangerous explosive payload to the target. In the case of the Black Dragon, that amounted to a huge 240 millimeter explosive projectile that weighed 160 kilograms, fired out of an 11 meter long barrel to a distance of 23 kilometers with pinpoint accuracy. Each shell impact from the M1 left a crater more than two meters deep and eight meters wide. And the radius in which a soldier could be rendered a casualty was unprecedented. For an unentrenched prone man up to 40 meters from detonation, death was almost certain. At 100 meters from the blast, that same man would have a 50% chance of becoming a casualty. And potentially deadly shrapnel fragments could be thrown as far as one kilometer away from the point of impact. But the Black Dragon was a towed artillery piece. Before it could be fired, it had to stop, uncouple, set up, and dig in. To fully exploit a tactical advantage on an increasingly mobile battlefield, it soon became clear that the artillery most capable of capitalizing on that advantage should also be mobile. All arms battle is dependent on uniform speed of action, tanks, infantry, and artillery all working together. And as the Cold War got chilly, the Americans introduced a mobile weapon of extraordinary destructiveness, the M109. The original M109 was introduced in 1962. 
And with its seventh update, the Paladin, every aspect of its destructive capability has been enhanced. The M109 Paladin is a self-propelled howitzer. And so what that means is that you have a 155 mm gun fitted to a vehicle chassis. The addition of gun stabilization systems, automated gun laying and loading systems to the 1960s chassis makes the Paladin capable of sustaining four rounds per minute for four minutes without fully emplacing. Together, a battery of six Paladins can deliver over a ton of ordnance per minute for each of those four minutes, an immense weight of destructive power delivered to a target. And the firing range of the Paladin has been extended from 24 to 30 kilometers with conventional shells by fitting of a longer, lighter, six-meter barrel, range that extends to 40 kilometers with the use of rocket-assisted guided projectiles. And it is those shells that do the damage. Improvements in high tensile steel has led to a reduction in the thickness of shell walls without loss of structural integrity, which has in turn allowed shells to carry more explosives. This, combined with improved explosive compounds, give the M109 Paladin a casualty effect 400% greater than a similar weapon from World War II. Less steel, more destructive power, more accurately delivered. The M109 is currently undergoing a further update that will no doubt increase its ability to deliver heavy blows from well behind the front lines. But for an infantryman in the heat of battle, destruction is up close and much more personal. Small bombs have been used in warfare since ancient times. The Greeks deployed fire bombs in antiquity, and since the invention of gunpowder, early versions of hand grenades with dangerously unpredictable smoldering fuses had been cautiously deployed, mainly in siege situations. Considered obsolete at the outset of World War I, the demands of trench warfare saw the idea of hand grenades resurrected, redesigned, and emerge as an indispensable item in the foot soldier's arsenal. Grenades put the destructive power of an artillery strike in an infantryman's pocket. And while initially they were thrown, the desire to project them farther led to developments that allowed the infantryman to expand his destructive reach beyond arm's length. In the latter stages of World War I, Riflemen, Lewis Gunners, and Grenadiers were joined by the Rifle Grenadier. Rifle Grenadiers fired a standard grenade fitted to a steel rod launched from an infantry rifle using a blank charge out to a range of up to 150 meters. A cup-type launcher was introduced later in World War I, a system that persisted through World War II, but using a propellant to kick the projectile out of a barrel creates recoil and it is recoil that limits both the range and the size of the projectile that can be fired. It was the adoption of the high-low pressure ballistic principle that revolutionized grenade launchers and led to weapons like the M203. The projectile in the M203 is set in a bi-chambered cartridge case with propellant cup fitted into the base. The cup contains the propelling charge and acts as the high pressure chamber. And the hollow cavity of the case, which surrounds the cup, acts as the low pressure chamber. When fired, the high pressure does not directly act on the projectile as it would in a standard gun. But instead, that pressure is allowed to bleed gradually into the hollow outer cavity at a controlled rate. This lower pressure then shoves rather than kicks the projectile out of the barrel at a constantly increasing muzzle velocity, dramatically reducing recoil. As a result, the M203, which weighs just one and a half kilograms and attaches under the barrel of an infantry rifle, fires a relatively large 40 millimeter shell weighing a quarter of a kilogram 
out to a range of 400 meters from a standing position. Weight and range that with a standard firing system would produce recoil beyond human capabilities. At each high explosive grenade carries 32 grams of modern composition B explosive. And once you detonate the explosive, that sets up a chemically supported shock wave within the explosive material. That shock wave would move between five and eight kilometers per second. And it's the shock wave that does the damage to vehicles, it kills people, and it destroys structures. While they don't release shrapnel in the quantities of the French 75, M203 shells have a similar casualty radius. And the arsenal includes rounds that can breach 75 millimeters of steel and a range of incendiary grenades. But incendiary weapons, like so much of the machinery of war, have a history all of their own. In August 1942, when the US Marines began the offensive on the Solomons Island of Guadalcanal, they encountered numerous underground fortifications built by the Japanese. Direct assaults on those interconnected tunnels proved extremely costly. And to clear them, the Americans turned to a weapon that had, in the past, proved ideal for aggressive assaults on bunkers and entrenched positions. The flamethrower. Fire in warfare is as old as warfare itself. You can go all the way back to the use of Greek fire, all that sort of thing. So it's not surprising that um, developers, inventors, and the military themselves uh, started looking at how to make use of fire or flame. First introduced onto the battlefields of World War I by the Germans in late 1914, the demoralizing physical and psychological effects of the new weapon that spewed flames 18 meters were immediately felt by the Allies. You have two tanks. One tank will hold your gas, in this case, nitrogen gas. The other tank will hold your flammable liquid. The nitrogen gas will drive the petrol down the pipe. So when you pull the trigger, you're releasing an element of the gas, which will be pushing the petrol out. As World War II approached, the basic fundamentals of the World War I design remained unchanged, a flammable liquid propelled by a gas. Although technological advances added to their lethality by introducing lighter cylinders, making flamethrowers man-portable. Of course, portable is a subjective term. And the American M1 flamethrower weighed a sizable 32 kilograms. But they proved indispensable in certain situations. In the main, they were used for structures to suppress bunkers, examples of which would be uh, the use of flamethrowers on Okinawa and coming ashore at Normandy. While the M1's range was greater than those of World War I, at just 40 meters, it involved the operator exposing most of his body when engaging suspected enemy positions. And the size of the tanks and general stance of the infantrymen using a flamethrower made for a tempting target. They're carrying what amounts to a flammable bomb on their back. They're very vulnerable. Ultimately, portable flamethrowers gave way to tank-mounted flame guns, which offered better range, protection for the crew, and made for a far more imposing threat. A threat that would, of course, be countered. Little more than a century ago, at the Battle of Cambrai, the world witnessed the first mass attack by an innovative British weapon inspired by simple farm machinery. Despite early examples being slow, cumbersome, and unreliable, they very quickly developed, and in less than 20 years, they had transformed the battlefield. If it's a straight tank versus infantry unit battle, pity the poor infantrymen. However, if you can come up with a, a weapon that's, that's flexible enough to get it into position when you need it, to put overwhelming force on one spot on that tank, well, that's the goal of, of the anti-tank role. By World War II, improvements in the internal combustion engine gave tanks greater speed, heavier armor, and more lethal weaponry. 
the need arose for a mobile weapon that could put the power to stop them in the hands of an infantryman. This war moves fast. The Germans and Italians found that out in Africa. We picked up some things, too. The bazooka. famous American bazooka, uh, nicknamed after the, the musical instrument that it, that it resembled, is a simple tube, the mechanical firing mechanism, sort of like a giant gun, but it's essentially a guidance tube or an initial guidance tube for this projectile. The recoil was balanced by the countering forces of the projectile exiting the front of the tube and the propellant exiting at the rear. With the pistol grip and shoulder support made of wood, the unit weighed just six and a half kilograms. And it was easy to operate between a crew of two, one to load and the other to fire the 60 millimeter projectile, which was capable of piercing armor up to 102 millimeters thick. Against all German tank types, often a single well-placed shot was all that was needed. However, success was not guaranteed. You have the ability to reload. Very important when you're trying to engage tanks. You might miss the tank. You might simply damage the tank. So to be able to fire more than one shot, a reusable system is very useful. It was such an effective, portable, destructive force that close to 500,000 bazookas, along with over 15 million rockets, were produced. But the Americans were not alone in looking to put highly destructive capabilities into the hands of their infantry. The Cold War era RPG-7 can trace its roots back to the bazooka. And like its forebear, this Soviet system follows the same simple principle of a reloadable tube that fires a rocket-propelled projectile. The differences between the two are in the missile. It looks like it's got a stick with a double conical shape on the end of the stick. When it's launched, there are fins that deploy, there's spring-loaded fins that open up, and that provides drag stabilization to the weapon system as it flies through the air. The RPG-7's rocket is initially thrown clear of the tube by a booster charge. Once in motion, the acceleration sets off a pressure-generated spark that ignites a sustainer motor, which accelerates the projectile once it's 11 meters from the launcher. By using this two-stage firing mechanism, the RPG-7 cuts the tube length from 1.5 meters, as it was on the bazooka, to just 90 centimeters. Projectiles up to 93 millimeters in diameter and four and a half kilograms in weight are fired at a velocity of 294 meters per second and the warhead makes up most of the weight, which, combined with the extra kinetic energy imparted by the rocket's vastly superior speed, means the RPG-7 can penetrate standard armor as thick as 750 millimeters. But by far, the RPG-7's greatest asset is its simplicity of construction, which has seen over 9 million enter service since 1961. It's prolific. It's widespread, and the technology is reasonably old, but it's simple. Lots of Soviet engineering was simple and effective, and the RPG-7 is no exception. The RPG-7 uses what is called a shaped charge, which is lethal against traditional armor. Suddenly, tanks were beatable, but in modern warfare, no single machine completely dominates for long. All weapons develop in response to improvements in others. The improvements in armor-piercing rounds saw the design tension between armor and anti-tank weaponry swing in favor of the weapon. With tanks rendered increasingly vulnerable, designers hit back in the 1970s with even more sophisticated defense systems. So one of the ways in which protection 
can be offered against something like a shaped charge weapon system such as an RPG-7 is by using explosive reactive armor. Explosive reactive armor consists of sheets or slabs of high explosive sandwiched between two plates. When hit by a shaped charge, the explosive detonates, driving the plates apart and damaging the incoming projectile. Not so with the munitions fired by the javelin, which use an ingenious tandem warhead. The Javelin is a guided missile, and it carries uh, on it a shape charge weapon system. So when it makes contact with the vehicle, it detonates the explosive that propels a high-velocity copper jet into the armor of the, the vehicle. A smaller precursor charge prepares the way for that copper jet. By pushing through the explosive reactive armor and clearing a path for the larger main warhead, to penetrate the target's primary defenses. Using a command launch unit that incorporates an integrated day-night sight, the missile is thrown free at launch. And like the RPG-7, only fires its rocket motor once clear of the crew. Engagement of airborne, static, or mobile ground-based targets is accomplished using either the traditional direct fire line of sight method or with help from the missile's inbuilt infrared guidance system, which can be programmed to attack armored vehicles at their weakest point. It does this by climbing to 150 meters as it reaches the target, and then rapidly descending from a steep angle with devastating effect. Tank armor on its roof is inherently thin across the board. So now you've got projectiles that are actually smashing down through the top of tank turrets rather than trying to penetrate through. The Javelin is the latest in highly mobile battlefield destruction. But destruction on a far bigger scale gets delivered not from on the battlefield, but rather from above it. For the first time in man's history, World War I introduced the concept of what we now refer to as total war. And with the entire resources and populations of the belligerent nations mobilized towards the war effort, with every human resource considered a functioning part of the enemy's war machine, city factories, warehouses, and even civilian populations, not just the military, became legitimate targets. And during World War II, the rapid development of aircraft, in particular the long-range heavy bomber, elevated the concept of total war to a new level, delivering wholesale destruction on entire cities, the like of which had never been seen before. On the 14th of March, 1945, the first of 42 new bombs were deployed over Germany's industrialized Ruhr Valley. Officially, they were uninspiringly designated as the bomb medium capacity. Unofficially, they were called Grand Slams. Eight meters long and shaped like an artillery shell, the Grand Slams warhead, which contained 4,000 kilograms of Torpex, an explosive 50% more powerful than TNT, was detonated after the bomb had penetrated deep into the earth giving a localized earthquake effect equivalent to 3.7 on the Richter scale. And the aircraft that carried these massive munitions was the Avro Lancaster. When it was designed, it was supposed to carry about 4,000 pounds of bombs. The British discovered that, in fact, it was such a strong and robust airframe that it could carry more. So they invented the Grand Slam. 22,000 pounds. That's five times the bomb carrying capacity than when the aircraft was designed. The Lancaster was born of the early wartime experience of the Avro Manchester, a twin engine bomber first flown in 1939. Within mere months, it became clear that the all new Manchester simply couldn't carry enough bombs far enough. Avro took the Manchester, revised the wing, added four 12-cylinder Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, and in early 1942, within just 18 months of being conceived, 
the Lancaster entered service. It was one of those examples of an aircraft which is designed and which is perfect from the beginning. So most of the Lancasters that were built and flown were Lancaster B1s. You no, know, there wasn't a need for, a, for many subsequent marks. It didn't continuously improve. Using an all-metal construction that maximized structural strength per weight, the Lancaster was agile, easy to fly, and capable of withstanding serious levels of damage in flight. And the durability of the design was enhanced by the fact that both the fuselage and the wings were assembled in modules, five apiece. But it was quite novel at the time. But it was built in sections, and that meant that it could be repaired in sections. So if you came back from Dusseldorf with a, a hole in your wing, the wing was replaced. It's a, an example of where the, the RAF, indeed the aircraft manufacturers, are adapting their construction methods to meet the needs of the people who fly this machine, because they always came back damaged. In all, Lancasters flew 156,000 operations and alone dropped over 618,000 tons of bombs over Germany between 1942 and 1945, destroying entire cities. And it did persuade the Germans that the war wasn't happening in Russia or in North Africa or in Normandy. It was happening in your street. So the bomber offensive, I think, was a crucial arm of the British war effort, especially the British war effort. And the Lancaster is at the heart of that. The Lancaster was one of the most iconic machines of World War II, a big, slow-moving bomber that operated in huge formations. The Lancaster was not intended to evade enemy defenses so much as beat them into submission. But the years after the Second World War saw a shift in thinking when it came to strategic bombing. In early 1946, the US Air Force issued a brief for a strategic bomber that flew above defenses with the range to carry out missions independent of bases controlled by other countries. And so in 1948, Boeing put their faith in a new engine and pushed the design envelope as far as they thought possible. What emerged from that process was an aircraft with a wingspan of 56 meters that would incorporate the two great aeronautical advances of the time, the enduring B-52 Strato Fortress. The B-52 bomber used a swept wing design and was purely jet engine powered with a long, narrow fuselage, which was primarily a series of bomb bays combined with eight engines on the wings. These advances gave the B-52 an operational range in excess of 14,000 kilometers, a top speed of 1,047 kilometers per hour, and a service ceiling of 16,000 meters which allowed it to launch a strike from well outside enemy territory. And its extended range provides it with the capacity to loiter outside a combat zone while enemy defenses are subdued and targets are identified. Most of the lower central fuselage of the 48-meter-long aircraft is given up to the storage of a 31,500-kilogram payload with the B-52 capable of carrying a most astounding array of munitions in its bulky frame. It was designed at the very beginning of the Cold War and subsequently has outseen designs that were supposed to replace it. So many people thought that it would no longer be in operation, but it still is. The B-52 is a great example of the speed of aircraft development in the years following World War II. It boasted five times the payload of the Lancaster, an aircraft that less than 10 years previous had been the supreme Allied strategic bomber. And it delivered that destructive force three times as quickly and four times as far. It is another example of an aircraft like the Lancaster that they just managed to get right the first time. But aircraft development during the Cold War didn't stop with the B-52. The combination of cabin pressurization and jet engine technology 
provided bombers like the B-52 with their main defensive capability, altitude. At 15,000 meters, they were able to operate safely, well beyond the range of conventional ground-based anti-aircraft weapons. But by the early 1960s, new radar-guided surface-to-air missiles had changed the rules yet again. High-altitude bombers suddenly became vulnerable. To defeat these systems, General Dynamics responded with what was an all-new concept, a long-range supersonic bomber that, rather than flying even higher, would evade radar detection by skimming close to the ground. The F-111 Aardvark. The main system that we had to help fly at low altitude was the train-following radar. So this was a, a forward-looking radar that actually uh, gave us an interpretation of the terrain in front, and we could link it in with the autopilot system on the aircraft, such that it would actually fly, you could fly hands off at anywhere from 200 to, feet to 1,000 feet, uh, any speeds up to 600 knots plus, if you really wanted to go that fast. That terrain-following radar system, which is standard in most of today's fighter jets, was untried when the F-111 was first flown in 1964 and gave the aircraft unprecedented assault capabilities. Undeterred by weather or darkness, the F-111 could enter enemy territory below radar level and proceed to attack its target at incredible speed. And it was equipped with two of the most powerful turbofan engines ever fitted to a production aircraft that also boasted another technological first. Afterburners. Basically, the afterburner system is you just pour a whole bunch of fuel down the back of the engine and light it up. And that's pretty much it. And it just gives you extra thrust. Commonplace now, afterburners gave the F-111 extraordinary performance capabilities. By using those afterburners, it could climb at close to 8,000 meters per minute and reach its service ceiling of 20,000 meters in less than three minutes. That puts the F-111 in strike fighter class even today. But despite being designated F for fighter, the F-111 was a genuine fighter bomber designed to carry a 13,500 kilogram payload. To create an aircraft that could perform well under load at low speed, take off and land from short runways, and yet still fly it over Mach 2, required another groundbreaking innovation. Variable geometry, or what we know as swing wings. If you look at a slow speed aircraft, you'll see that it has a fairly straight sort of fat wing. A lot easier to generate lift at slower speeds that way. As you want to go faster, you actually want to go to more of a delta shape, which is predominantly the sort of shape that you see in high-speed aircraft. And that's where you start sweeping the wings back to 72 degrees. The F-111 remained in service with the US and Australian Air Forces for 30 years. But like the B-52, the F-111 was principally designed during the Cold War to deliver a weapon of such destructive power that when it was unleashed in 1945, it changed the planet forever. In 1939, a letter delivered by the esteemed physicist Albert Einstein to the then US President Franklin D. Roosevelt resulted in the United States taking a gamble as World War II erupted into a destructive global conflict, Roosevelt ordered the establishment of the U.S. Uranium Project to investigate the possibility of creating a controlled chain reaction. In June 1942, the Uranium Project fell under the control of the U.S. military and was renamed the Manhattan Project. And in December of that year, under a Chicago football stadium, the world's first controlled nuclear reaction was achieved. With the war looking more and more like it would end in an Allied defeat, what followed was the birth of the single biggest weapons development project the world had ever seen. 
The Manhattan Project that the, the Americans developed, which was the scientific and the military uh, development of these weapons, was just enormous. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of workers worked on sites, what, 17 sites in 12 states, huge secret cities built across the US, all feeding into this enterprise. It was a colossal program. One team at Los Alamos, led by Robert Oppenheimer, worked on the physics of the bomb. Huge industrial plants in Tennessee and Washington state were established to extract the plutonium, each arm of the massive operation working in extreme secrecy. After five years of frenetic research and billions of dollars, on July the 16th, 1945, the Manhattan Project came to fruition. A device was successfully exploded in the New Mexico desert. With a force of 22 kilotons, the equivalent of 22,000 tons of TNT, it dwarfed anything that had come before it. One of the most profound and, and moving aspects of the whole atomic weapon story is that the, the men, mostly men, the men who developed the bomb, were the first to become aware of what the destructive capacity of the bomb was. And they debated within themselves whether or not they should be allowing this to happen. And I think one of the considerations that swayed them into regarding this as, as being justifiable was that the, many of them knew exactly what they were up against. Many of them were Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany who knew what had happened to Europe's Jews and knew the costs of not defeating Nazi Germany. And while the atomic bomb may have been designed with Germany in mind, by the time the atomic bomb was completed, Hitler was gone and the Germans had surrendered. But the Allies were still at war with Japan. A little after 8.15 a.m. on the 6th of August, 1945, the Enola Gay, a heavily modified B-29 bomber, dropped a device measuring just three meters in length, 71 centimeters in diameter, and weighing just 4,000 kilograms over the unsuspecting Japanese city of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, a manufacturing center of 350,000 people, located about 800 kilometers from Tokyo, had not been randomly selected as a target for the atomic bomb. It had been chosen. Firstly, because up until this point in the war, unlike Tokyo, it had been largely unscathed by conventional bombing. And secondly, because the city was flat. bomb went off. Three and a half kilometers of destruction, a, a fireball that big, killed probably 80,000 people more or less instantly, wounded about another 80,000 people. And because it was a flat site, the impact of the bomb went for miles and in a circular way, diminishing as it, it progressed, but still devastating, utterly destroying this city. When Little Boy, as the bomb was called, detonated 580 meters above the city, it did so with a force equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT. As it exploded, intense heat rays and radiation were released in all directions. And almost instantly, 13 square kilometers of that city was transformed into ruins. And when that city's devastation failed to elicit a Japanese surrender, just three days later, a second weapon, Fat Man, was deployed. But heavy smoke and cloud cover over the city of Kokura caused a mid-mission diversion to the secondary target, the port city of Nagasaki. Not an ideal target from the bomb maker's point of view because it was a, a hilly, it was in a valley, and so the blast was constrained. But even so, it, it killed 40,000 people. Fat Man had an energy yield of approximately 22 kilotons of TNT, and the fireball caused by the explosion was 280 meters in diameter creating a surface temperature of around 5,000 degrees Celsius. The role of the two weapons in ending the war remains the subject of ongoing debate. 
Emperor Hirohito's decision to surrender was also influenced by Russia's invasion of Manchuria and declaration of war against Japan on August 8th. But one thing is certain, the world has never been the same since. One of the claims that's made about the use of Little Boy and Fat Man on Japan was that one of the major reasons for doing it was not so much to defeat Japan, but to signal to Russia that the US had this incredible new capability. Whether that's true or not, uh, I certainly don't know. But what is certainly true is that the creation of atomic weapons radically changed the global strategic environment. A change that would lead to a 40-year period of uncertainty known as the Cold War. In 1945, there had been just three nuclear weapons on the planet. By 1950, there were 304, 299 in the US arsenal, and five in the Soviet unions. So we entered into the era of the Cold War, and it was a Cold War for a reason. Although there were many hot spots, the two great powers that were competing never went to war against each other. And probably the main reason for that is the existence of nuclear weapons. But even a Cold War can be won. Determined to maintain their lead in what was now a nuclear arms race, in October 1952, the Americans conducted Operation Ivy on the Eniwetok Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The plan was to detonate a device named Mike, an experiment with a higher yielding form of nuclear explosion that derives a significant proportion of its explosive energy from fusion. A thermonuclear device, Mike was the first of what we now know as a hydrogen bomb. At 7.15 a.m. local time on the 31st of October, 1952, Mike was detonated from a control ship stationed 55 kilometers away. The detonation resulted in a massive explosion equivalent to 500 times the explosive force of the bomb dropped on Nagasaki just seven years earlier. Four, three, two, one. After the test was confirmed to the public, Time magazine reported that the force and horror of atomic weapons has entered a new dimension. The first full-dress H-blast turned the mid-Pacific sandspit named Illusia Lab into a submarine crater. And indeed, it had. Illusia Lab, the atoll on which Mike's detonation took place, was vaporized. The explosion produced a fireball six kilometers in diameter and a mushroom cloud 160 kilometers wide. Unsurprisingly, in 1952, it was the largest nuclear explosion ever detonated. And as the tests continued on both sides and with the development of missiles to deliver warheads, the numbers of nuclear weapons skyrocketed, a proliferation that changed the nature of warfare. At the heart of the idea of nuclear deterrence is something called mutually assured destruction, or MAD. And, and that term is, is quite literally chosen. The idea is that you would be simply mad to start a nuclear war, because where the other side had the ability to wipe you out if you launched against them, and they had the ability to launch before you could guarantee that you'd taken out all of their nuclear capabilities, in starting a war, you would essentially choose to destroy yourself. In 1955, there were 2,636 warheads of which the Americans had 2,400. By 1965, that number had increased to over 35,000 as the US and Russia battled for supremacy. With enough weapons to destroy the planet several times over, an uneasy status quo emerged. Great powers simply couldn't afford to go to war with one another. And that's what nuclear deterrence relies on. The incredible power of the opposing nuclear forces means that there are no rational ways to start a war with one another. At the height of the third phase of the Cold War, the world was home to over 61,000 nuclear weapons. 
That number has now dropped to a little over 16,000. But should they ever be used, mass destruction would result of a kind that the men of World War I, a mere 100 years ago, could never have imagined.